Mark Faber's stock market crash is coming how to protect yourself if you fear. Market analyst Mark Faber is starting to see a worse setup than just before the 2008 market meltdown. Mark Faber explains, the dollar is weak. All that is dog and pony. The real thing is they can't stimulate the economy by growing any more debt. The system is based on compounding debt. So, it has to reset, and any wealth that is in the system gets reset too. They can keep the game going until confidence is lost. Once confidence is lost, it's over, and I do think it's close. The big kahunas are sucking as much wealth out of the system as they can. Thirty years ago Wall Street slid into the abyss, suffering the biggest one-day market fall of over 22%. Since then the Dow Jones has risen from 1,738 points to an all-time high of over 23,000, raising fears another historic crash is on the cards. On October 19, 1987, share prices went into a free fall, with millions of pounds and fortunes lost in a matter of hours. The fateful day went down in history as Black Monday. Three decades later and there are worrying signs that history could be about to repeat itself, according to Simon Watkins, former trader and author of The Complete Guide to Successful Financial Markets Trading. Factors that were apparent in the run-up to the historic crash are now being mirrored in 2017, Mr. Watkins has warned. For example, America's top stock index the Dow Jones is today trading at close to all-time highs. Back in 1987, U.S. stocks had also reached record highs in August, but then dramatically tumbled by 508 points just two months later. The U.S. economy is also retracing a similar pattern. In the run-up to Black Monday, the U.S. was in a period of moderate economic growth, but amid inflation actual growth was very small. The U.S. is also currently experiencing its third longest economic expansion in history, Mr. Watkins pointed out. Business cycles are typically around three to five years, suggesting that a correction is imminent. In another striking similarity between 2017 and 1987, there were significant fears over Asia and China's economy stability. The Black Monday crash started in Hong Kong's stock markets overnight. Oil markets were unsettled in the mid-80s after Saudi Arabia abandoned its role of propping up oil prices and by mid-1986 prices had halved. Since 2014, oil has again been hit a dramatic drop in value, going from more than $100 a barrel to less than $60 today. I must read I have made the point many times over the last several years that I thought the structure of the market was such that it couldn't really decline, it could only crash. In the last year or so I have been able to put some meat on the bones of that idea based on data from various people. After the recent Grants Conference, I shared the thoughts from one of the speakers who had tallied up the data to show that there are various strategies that mimic portfolio insurance and were sizable enough to create a similar outcome. Faber goes into detail about that, and other factors, and I think that anyone who has any exposure to the market either by having money in it or because you participate in our economy, which is to say, everyone needs to understand the points made in this report. Just to share a few thoughts to wet your whistle, he notes that what we have been seeing lately has created a situation whereby, responsible investors are driven out of business by reckless actors. In effect, the entire market converges to what professional option traders call a naked short straddle. A structure dangerously exposed to fragility. He then adds, volatility is now the only undervalued asset class in the world. The price for business's usual favor goes on to describe the global short volatility trade as any strategy that derives small incremental gains on the assumption of stability in exchange for substantial loss in the event of change. One of the perverse reasons why a strategy is destined to fail as this is continues is because it can work longer than one would think that it should, and then participants pile in thinking that the naysayers are delusional. Faber adds, many investors, and even practitioners, are ignorant or in denial that they are holding a synthetic short option in their portfolio. In current markets, there is an estimated $1.12 to $1.42 trillion in implicit short volatility exposure. He then describes what happens to folks who are in this boat where they all happen to be short gamma. When large numbers of market participants are short gamma, implicitly or explicitly, the effect can reinforce price direction into periods of high turbulence. 
In other words, if the market starts down, everybody has to try sell at the same time, which is precisely what happened in 1987. The frequency illusion Faber then makes a side comment about algos and computerized trading that I thought was very important. Markets are not a closed system. The rules change. As machines trade against machines, self-reflexivity risk is amplified. 90% of the world's data across history has been generated in the last two years. It is very hard to find quality financial data at actionable time increments going back past 20 or even 10 years. Now what if we give all the available data, most of it extremely recent, to a machine to manage money? The AI machine will optimize to what has worked over that short data set, namely a massively leveraged volatility trade. For this reason alone, expect at least one major massive machine learning fund with excellent historical returns to fail spectacularly when the volatility regime shifts. This will be a canary in the coal mine. There were many more great points that he made, which is why I say that everyone needs to read this. It explains not only why the market is crash prone, but how this situation was created. And though we don't know the timing, knowing what the outcome looks like helps one understand what they're up against so they can prepare a game plan. Market analyst Jim Ricates has deep Wall Street experience and is starting to see a worse setup than just before the 2008 market meltdown. Ricates explains, the dollar is weak. All that is dog and pony. The real thing is they can't stimulate the economy by growing any more debt. The system is based on compounding debt. So, it has to reset, and any wealth that is in the system gets reset too. They can keep the game going until confidence is lost. Once confidence is lost, it's over, and I do think it's close. The big kahunas are sucking as much wealth out of the system as they can. Thirty years ago Wall Street slid into the abyss, suffering the biggest one-day market fall of over 22%. Since then the Dow Jones has risen from 1,738 points to an all-time high of over 23,000, raising fears another historic crash is on the cards. Today's stock market has parallels to the 1987 market, said Faber, adding that valuations are at historic highs. The Fed and central bank counterparts are pumping money, and sentiment is wildly bullish. Analysts have been warning recent stock market moves look eerily similar to just before 1987's Black Monday. Investors also raised concerns steep valuations might mean a correction is overdue. On October 19, 1987, stock markets around the world crashed, shutting billions in value very quickly. The crash began in Hong Kong and spread to Europe, hitting the United States after other markets had already declined by a significant margin. The Dow Jones Industrial Average, which comprises the 30 largest U.S. publicly traded companies, lost 22.6% of its value that day. Faber says to understand what happened with the market we have to recall the global financial crisis of 2008. According to he, unprecedented amounts, over $20 trillion in cash, was printed and thrown at Wall Saint creditors to repair their technically insolvent balance sheets. A former stockbroker, Faber said that now in 2017, the debt pyramid has never been higher. Just one indicator of this would be the sovereign bond market in the US and UK that are trading at multi-hundred year highs thanks to the Ponzi economics of central bank debt monetization, printing money and buying back their own debt. Talking about the risks of another Black Monday equities crash, Kaiser said it is impossible to say exactly when this truckload of market risk explodes, but it's 100% guaranteed that it will be by far the biggest loss of wealth ever recorded. But it's time to add another warning sign to the list. Certain high yield or junk bond indices have fallen below their 200-day moving average. This can be indicative of a stock market correction. Junk bonds are riskier than equity. When they get in trouble, it's a sign that the corporate issuers are having trouble meeting their obligations. That in turn is indicative of reduced revenues or profits, tight financial conditions, and lower earnings. Panics in October 1987 and December 1994 were preceded by distress in bonds about six months earlier. While there is no deterministic relationship, bonds are a good leading indicator of stocks because they are higher in the capital table and feel distress sooner. The October 1987 one day 22% decline in stocks, and the December 1994 tequila crisis in Mexican debt were ugly for investors. 
The bond market gave a six-month early warning both times. It may be doing so again. But what the Fed? Is it setting markets up for a fall? It's true that the Fed has been raising interest rates since 2015 and had engaged them tapering for two years before that. Yet, these actions hardly constitute tight money. The tightness or ease of monetary policy needs to be judged relative to financial and economic conditions. You can have easy money at a 10% interest rate if inflation is running at 15%, something like the conditions of the late 1970s. In that world, the real interest rate is negative 5.0%, 10% minus 15% equals minus 5%. In effect, the bank pays you to borrow. That's easy money. By most models including the famous Taylor rule, rates in the US today should be about 2.5% instead of 1.0%. We have easy money today and have had since 2006. This comes on top of the too low for too long policy of Alan Greenspan from 2002 to 4, which led directly to the housing bubble and collapse in 2007. The US really has not had a hard money period since the mid 1990 seconds. That's true of most of the developed economies also. What's going to happen when central banks start to normalize interest rates and balance sheets and return to a true tight money policy in preparation for the next recession? He added that countries like Russia are smart to be loading into gold and initiating crypto strategies ahead of the bond apocalypse and equity inferno. Individual investors should be doing the same. How close are we to another market meltdown worse than 2008? Faber says, Every week I do an insider's trading corner, and I show you what the insiders are doing generally, and then I do an individual stock. It's pretty obvious. The insiders are getting out in droves. This is the second most expensive stock market in history. It's more expensive than 1929. Also, there are no buyers on the other side of this market if a lot of people want to sell at the same time. So, how long can central banks keep the debt party going? When is the next crash? Faber says, I am worried that it will happen before the end of this year. I think that is what they are trying to do with getting all the regulations. Since the banks have passed the stress tests, what are they doing? They are getting all these huge dividend payouts and all of these stock buybacks, which primarily benefit the guys on the top. So, I think they are getting ready for the crash. If they can hold it together, then they are going to want as much wealth out of the system. I am talking about the one percenters. If they can hold it together, we might get a little more time, but any black swan event, then it will be out of their control, and it will be game over. That could happen anytime. What would it look like to the man on the street? Faber predicts, the Bank for International Settlements, BIS, showed how they would bail in the banks over the weekend. It's pretty easy to see if you look across the pond to Greece. You will have no access to your wealth. You may have a pretty statement that says you have Z's stocks in there. You just can't touch it. It will be the same thing with your bank account. Basically, access will be gone. That's what it will look like, and people are going to be freaked out. What do you do when the computer says no? There is a certain amount of cash in the ATM. Maybe $60 a day, maybe $300 a day. Who knows? But it's not going to be enough. So, that's what it is going to look like. Most people will freak out because they have about three days of food in their house. Most grocery stores have about three days of food on their shelves. So, what happens after day six? People will be scared for sure, and they will panic. How to protect yourself if you fear a stock market crash is coming. 1. The bull market is old. Investing at the end of 2017 feels a bit like being on mile 21 of a marathon, Faber writes in the report. Sure, there's still room to run. But this race has to end eventually. 2. Valuations are elevated. This isn't a warning based only on one fashionable metric like Robert Schiller's cape reading. If you look at a basket of common valuation metrics things like price to earnings, price to book, price to free cash flow, and so on they're all generally saying the same thing, Faber says. 3. Sentiment is mighty bullish. Investors are as optimistic as they have been in 30 years, 
by one measure. That's noteworthy because irrational exuberance is one of the hallmarks of a downturn. 4. Where's the volatility? A recent reading of the BO volatility index VIX, plus 2.40% none of this means a crash is imminent, said Faber, the chief investment officer of Cambria Investment Management. After all, some of these arguments have persisted for a while and the market hasn't quit rising yet. I like to say it's the Jay Cutler bull market, he says, referring to a statistically impressive Chicago Bears quarterback who was nevertheless run out of town by fans and team managers. It's a very melancholy, nobody seems to care that much market, despite a track record of success. Faber described himself as a trend follower at heart, and history shows markets can go much longer than people think. Still, he warned that, right now, trend followers see a yellow warning light and that the red light of a correction or crash is very likely to follow. It could be next month or two years from now, but eventually the trend will roll over, Faber said. To read Faber's research on the current market environment, check out his archive of white papers on Cambria's website. Or get the insight directly from him at a MarketWatch International Investing Panel on October 24th in Los Angeles. If you're interested in attending this free event, please email events at marketwatch.com. How do investors protect themselves? Many of these arguments probably sound familiar. Even if they do, you still may be wondering how you protect yourself against a possible correction. After all, stocks still seem like they are the only game in town. But Faber warns it's dangerous when investors only think about how to achieve the biggest possible returns. Sometimes like right now it makes sense instead to see a portion of your portfolio as insurance instead of just a reach for big profits. Insurance type of strategies or funds, on their own, are not a good investment just like buying house insurance or car insurance on your own is not a good investment. There's not a positive return, Faber said. But does it make life easier when things hit the fan? The idea of insurance is partially about protecting your portfolio from the direct losses caused by a downturn in the market but also to protect your portfolio from yourself. Countless studies show behavioral hangups and cognitive biases cause even smart investors to do stupid things. I would argue that anything that keeps people behaving better and keeping their investment plan in place is a worthwhile cost, Faber said. So if you give up a little return at the expense of less volatility or lower drawdowns, it's a worthwhile investment. That's why Cambria Investments created the Cambria Tail Risk F Tail. Minus 0.42% which is heavily invested in stable U.S. Treasuries and supplements the portfolio with out-of-the-money puts on the broad market to offset any stock declines. If you look at the bear markets and the worst months, the best thing to do to hedge is puts better than gold, better than bonds, better than everything, Faber said. And when you consider the extremely low market volatility and the general affordability of out-of-the-money options, the puts purchased by the tail F are quite cheap these days. Of course, the tail F has slowly declined this year as the put options have been on the wrong side of the rally and as treasury bonds have been incredibly sluggish. But for investors simply looking at the track record of this fund during the good times, you're missing the point. Cambria isn't the first company to try to provide investors some kind of hedging strategy via an exchange-traded fund. The Ranger Equity Bear at HDGE Minus 0.50% tactically short sells what the managers see as weak U.S. stocks. It is down about 10% since January 1st thanks to a rising market, but in a downdraft should perform quite differently. Another alternative is the first trust long slash short equity at FTLS, plus 0.43% which is tactical about stocks to bet on and which to bet against. This fund has fared better than the other two Fs with an 8% return since January 1st as managers have biased toward long positions. But it retains the flexibility to go short if the environment warrants it. With insurance like this, the cost of holding in the good times is really where you get dinged, Faber said. I would argue that anything that keeps people behaving better and keeping their investment plan in place is a worthwhile cost. So if you give up a little return at the expense of less volatility or lower drawdowns, it's a worthwhile investment. In fact, Faber said he has about 10% of his own portfolio in the fund. It helps me behave better, he said. This had halved.
Since 2014, oil has again been hit a dramatic drop in value, going from more than $100 a barrel to less than $60 today. I must treat I have made the point many times over the last several years that I thought the structure of the market was such that it couldn't really decline, it could only crash. In the last year or so I have been able to put some meat on the bones of that idea based on data from various people. After the recent grants conference, I shared the thoughts from one of the speakers who had tallied up the data to show that there are various strategies that mimic portfolio insurance and were sizable enough to create a similar outcome. Faber goes into detail about that, and other factors, and I think that anyone who has any exposure to the market either by having money in it or because you participate in our economy, which is to say, everyone needs to understand the points made in this report. Just to share a few thoughts to wet your whistle, he notes that what we have been seeing lately has created a situation whereby, responsible investors are driven out of business by reckless actors. In effect, the entire market converges to what professional option traders call a naked short straddle. A structure dangerously exposed to fragility. He then adds, volatility is now the only undervalued asset class in the world. The price for business as usual favor goes on to describe the global short volatility trade as any strategy that derives small incremental gains on the assumption of stability in exchange for substantial loss in the event of change. One of the perverse reasons why a strategy is destined to fail as this is continues is because it can work longer than one would think that it should, and then participants pile in thinking that the naysayers are delusional. Faber adds, many investors, and even practitioners, are ignorant or in denial that they are holding a synthetic short option in their portfolio. In current markets, there is an estimated $1.12 to $1.42 trillion in implicit short volatility exposure. He then describes what happens to folks who are in this boat where they all happen to be short gamma. When large numbers of market participants are short gamma, implicitly or explicitly, the effect can reinforce price direction into periods of high turbulence. In other words, if the market starts down, everybody has to try sell at the same time, which is precisely what happened in 1987. The frequency illusion Faber then makes a side comment about algos and computerized trading that I thought was very important. Markets are not a closed system. The rules change. As machines trade against machines, self-reflexivity risk is amplified. 90% of the world's data across history has been generated in the last two years. It is very hard to find quality financial data at actionable time increments going back past 20 or even 10 years. Now what if we give all the available data, most of it extremely recent, to a machine to manage money? The AI machine will optimize to what has worked over that short data set, namely a massively leveraged volatility trade. For this reason alone, expect at least one major massive machine learning fund with excellent historical returns to fail spectacularly when the volatility regime shifts. This will be a canary in the coal mine. There were many more great points that he made. Which is why I say that everyone needs to read this. It explains not only why the market is crash prone, but how this situation was created. And though we don't know the timing, knowing what the outcome looks like helps one understand what they're up against so they can prepare a game plan. Market analyst Jim Ricates has deep Wall Street experience and is starting to see a worse setup than just before the 2008 market meltdown. Ricates explains, the dollar is weak. All that is dog and pony. The real thing is they can't stimulate the economy by growing any more debt. The system is based on compounding debt. So, it has to reset, and any wealth that is in the system gets reset too. They can keep the game going until confidence is lost. Once confidence is lost, it's over, and I do think it's close. The big kahunas are sucking as much three decades later and they're worrying signs that history could be about to repeat itself, according to Simon Watkins, former trader and author of The Complete Guide to Successful Financial Markets Trading. Factors that were apparent in the run-up to the historic crash are now being mirrored in 2017, Mr. Watkins has warned. For example, America's top stock index the Dow Jones is today trading at close to all-time highs. Back in 1987, U.S. stocks had also reached record highs in August, but then dramatically tumbled by 508 points just two months later. The U.S. economy is also retracing a similar pattern.
In the run-up to Black Monday, the U.S. was in a period of moderate economic growth, but amid inflation actual growth was very small. The U.S. is also currently experiencing its third longest economic expansion in history, Mr. Watkins pointed out. Business cycles are typically around three to five years, suggesting that a correction is imminent. In another striking similarity between 2017 and 1987, there were significant fears over Asia and China's economy stability. The Black Monday crash started in Hong Kong's stock markets overnight. Oil markets were unsettled in the mid-80s after Saudi Arabia abandoned its role of propping up oil prices and by mid-1986 prices Mark Faber's stock market crash is coming how to protect yourself if you fear. Market analyst Mark Faber is starting to see a worse setup than just before the 2008 market meltdown. Mark Faber explains, the dollar is weak. All that is dog and pony. The real thing is they can't stimulate the economy by growing any more debt. The system is based on compounding debt. So, it has to reset, and any wealth that is in the system gets reset too. They can keep the game going until confidence is lost. Once confidence is lost, it's over, and I do think it's close. The big kahunas are sucking as much wealth out of the system as they can. Thirty years ago Wall Street slid into the abyss, suffering the biggest one-day market fall of over 22%. Since then the Dow Jones has risen from 1,738 points to an all-time high of over 23,000. Raising fears of another historic crash is on the cards. On October 19, 1987, share prices went into a free fall, with millions of pounds and fortunes lost in a matter of hours. The fateful day went down in history as Black Monday.